The SMART study is uh, the largest prospective study of its kind that has been performed where we have we uh, have chromosome, uh, microchromosome microarray for all patients. So there have been a number of NIPT studies where they've had results from patients who turned out positive for the test result, high trisomy 21 or whatever it might be, but they really haven't been where they've looked at all, having a microarray in all of them. So it was a multi-center study involved 20,000 patients over several years and was funded by Natera. Last year at uh, Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine in 2021, uh, I call it my plumber's union, but the group of people who do what I do, published a, uh, or presented this smart paper. I had three oral presentations by the, by the PIs. Um, the first involved how does NIPT work for average risk patients? That is, we know that women over 35 are, we call them advanced maternal age. A lot of my patients didn't like that terminology, but that's what it is. They're at high risk for trisomy 21. But the argument had been because this, uh, trisomy 21 is less common in women under 35, even though the majority of kids with trisomy 21 are born, to, are born to women under 35, statistically it's less common. How does it work in that subset of patients? And, the belief had been that the NIPT test doesn't work as well. And what SMART showed was that for patients who are under 35, the positive predictive values for trisomy is 21, 18, 13, the common aneuploidies we screen for, were actually very high and very similar to that of a 35-year-old. So it's a very good test for a woman of any age. And in fact, ACOG, my other plumbers union of OBGYN, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, had come out in 2020 um, and said, this, uh, 2019, I should say, and said, this is correct. We, we support average risk women to receive NIPT. So if they're 18 or 28 or 38, it's a good test. Uh, we also applied what we call our artificial intelligence and developed new algorithms, revised our algorithms, by the better term, and found that we could improve our positive picture value just a little bit as well. So that was the first oral presentation. The second one, which I think is the key one, from the standpoint of care of families and improving outcomes, optimizing outcomes, was the 22Q microdeletion paper. And what that study showed uh, was because we now had, we had follow-up data on all these kids with microarrays, so we knew if they did or didn't have a 22Q. But we demonstrated that with our new algorithm, we could have a positive predictive value of 52.4% compared to the old positive predictive value of only 20%. Now, 20% is really good positive predictive value compared to the old quadruple screen, which we doctors used for many, many years, and some still are, of 3 or 4%. But 52.4% means that one out of two kids with a positive result or mothers with a positive result are at risk. Now, even if those parents say we don't want invasive testing, if they do want invasive testing, it can be offered and we can confirm it. And then patients have parents have choices early on in pregnancy. But if the parents say, you know, we wouldn't do anything differently, which is a common statement by many families in the United States, it now allows you to uh, have that mother have a special ultrasound look for heart problems, say, you should probably deliver at a children's hospital so that they can check your baby out. They check calcium at birth because half these kids will have calcium deficiencies. So they treat early on this endocrine problem and can improve outcomes. It's thought that the low calcium causes subclinical seizures. Every baby at birth gets vaccinated. It's born in a hospital. These babies have immune system issues, immune deficiencies, three fourths of them. So, in these subset of babies, the pediatricians and units tell don't vaccinate this kid until we confirm what their immune status is. So, now in the first 10 minutes of life, we've altered the care for this baby and hopefully improved the outcome. Thirdly, two thirds of these babies have palate problems, some not very obvious. They don't feed for very well at all. So, we try to encourage mothers to breastfeed. These babies don't nurse or breastfeed very well. So, we recommend the peds. Uh, ENT, some type of evaluation of ear, nose, and throat doctor to look for palate pumps. So again, we can help these babies feed so they don't become failing to thrive. And lastly, they all should have a newborn heart ultrasound to make sure there's no major heart birth effects before they go home. So this new 22Q, I believe, is really going to improve the outcome when it's utilized across patients. Uh, it's going to improve the outcome for many families. And in fact, the uh, article was just published last month in the American Journal of OBGYN, and in a letter to the editor, the authors responded in saying, we think that 22Q screening broadly across the population using NIPT is ready for prime time care. So now we just need my specialty unit organization of ACOG and SMFM to say, okay, everybody, let's start screening for it. And we think that's going to come soon. Uh, the third paper just briefly showed that if you have a low fetal fraction, this is not really genetic related, but if you have a low fetal fraction, the percent of placental cell-free DNA on two consecutive test results 
These mothers are at increased risk for bad things happening during pregnancy, preterm birth, and preeclampsia. So now we've identified a subset of women who, while it's not rare disease, definitely preterm birth, preterm birth is the most common cause of long-term handicap in the United States right now from, from a newborn standpoint. So now we have a way of potentially identifying mothers who are at high risk, potentially applying interventions, and again, improving outcomes for these children.